Welcome to Show Studio's live panel discussions. In these discussions, experts from all parts of the fashion industry discuss and debate the most important fashion week shows of the season. Today, on the final day of Paris menswear, we're going to be discussing Craig Green Autumn Winter 20. So, to be fair, oh, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Yola Lewis Edwards. Um, I am the director of High Fashion Talk, and I'll let my other panelists um, introduce themselves. I'm Mike Key, and I'm a production manager. I'm Michael Tucker, and I'm a creative consultant. I'm Ayo, and I'm a videographer, and I also run a YouTube channel called The Fashion Archive. I'm Tony Cook, and I'm a menswear stylist. Um, I'm Caitlin Yates, and I'm a menswear fashion designer. Okay. Um, so to kick off this, the discussion, to be fair, you have to, be, you have, to have a very high IQ to understand Craig Green. Craig Green is part of the meme world, um, and a lot of his uh, collections are shared in many memes, um, which we'll show on the screen. Um, one of his first collections, um, the first with Man, um, started the article What a Plank, um, which featured his design with planks all over the face, um, which spurred um, a lot of memes across the internet. Um, do you think that people relate to memes um, with fashion? Um, do you enjoy fashion memes? I love fashion memes. I feel like it's kind of just freely taking the piss. Kind of fashion is so serious and when you're working in it, everything's so serious and then you kind of take a look and step back and look at it and you're just like, this is clothes. Like everyone is so on edge and at each other's throats, it's clothes. And so kind of to be able to actually laugh at it, it's funny, like it's relatable. I love, I love them. <laughs> yeah, and I guess it kind of like opens it up to a different audience as well. So say if like, you know, people who are in the fashion industry or fashion fans, they, look at the content where the memes maybe will kind of, you know, be tagged within a bigger audience that would not necessarily kind of tune into Vogue and look at a Craig Green runway show. Yeah, I think it's a way that people sort of relate to the world and then to fashion in general. Um, do you think maybe fashion designers sort of think about memes when they design now? That Do they create something that they know it's going to be memed? I think so. I think where you have sort of designers previously doing things purely for Instagram or for the show to go viral. I think we look at people like Demna, what he'd done previously at Vetemar, what he's doing at Balenciaga now. He's using meme culture to their advantage. So they're always going to include certain looks which will be very memeable, or even for the advertising campaigns, they've sort of become yeah. meme esque yeah. themselves, mm -hmm. haven't yeah. they, as well? So it's delving into that world where people are becoming more aware of it and maybe utilising it to then give back. Yeah. I feel at the minute it's only the bigger brands though who've got the nerve to really push it. Because they can do it. Because yeah. they can, because they've got the financial stability to take a loss if it doesn't, if it doesn't yeah. work, it doesn't pull off, they can play it off. Whereas I think with younger designers, I don't think they've got it in mind when they're creating a collection more when they see it. When someone like you said, like the Daily Mail, yeah. I think did the What the Plank <laughs> headline. That just became like a trend for it was about six years ago, I remember every, mm. after every fashion week, you'd check the Daily Mail and there'd be <laughs> a new article, and you're like, these designers are on drugs. <laughs> it's like, every, every one, yeah, there was another one. Yeah, it was more like an, like an organic thing, wasn't it? That just happened, it wasn't like he was sitting there. Yeah, and you've got like... be an amazing yeah. meme that's gonna... You'd got like Steve this. from Doncaster commenting on like, a <laughs> green show, <laughs> and that was kind of the start of... I think that was the start of me seeing like the meme culture coming into fashion a lot yeah. more. As menswear grew, more men were getting involved and more men are happy to kind of poke fun, laugh at it. And yeah. But it's, yeah, it kind of organically started for me seeing it through like the Daily Mail and those cheap tabloid yeah. papers. That's what I quite love about it though, is I love people that can poke for, as, as you mentioned, you know, it's such yeah. a, considered such a serious industry. Mm -hmm. But I love it when brands or designers will probably repost the meme. You know, yeah. I love people that can take the piss out of themselves and actually yeah. really see you know, the, the joke in it. I think that shows a more human side and it breaks down those barriers. We're talking about you know, the democratization of fashion over the past 10 years. 
and it's become so democratised and more open to a wider audience. I think this sort of aids that even more so. I mean, I love this one with Skeppy. It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> this was literally posted everywhere. Yeah. yeah, it seems that memes do have a greater reach than anything else in fashion nearly at, at this point. Um, like, loads of people don't even know it's Fashion Week, um, whereas everybody will see that meme of Skepta wearing the cray green Moncler <laughs> and that. Do you think that sells fashion? Do people buy it because of the meme? I feel like it does because uh, through memes, people that aren't normally into fashion will find out about brands. So if you don't know what Cray Green is, you've never seen it before, you might see a meme and you might wonder through that meme, oh, who's this designer? What is this? And then you might delve deeper and that could eventually lead to sales. So I think memes actually does have a place in terms of actually uh, broadening the spectrum of people that actually um, look into these brands. So in terms of sales, yeah, I do feel like memes does contribute. It's like brand outreach, isn't it? It's almost like marketing without having to do it with no budget. They're doing it for you. So, yeah. you know, you're outreaching, you've got much further outreach than you will do through the more traditional channels, you know, through, through meme culture. So I think, you know, for instance, like with the Rick tote bags or whatever, that you get free with shoes and jeans, yeah. that became a meme in and of itself. <laughs> yeah. You know, and amongst various different things. And I think the, the lifespan of products as well can depend on a meme as well. <laughs> yeah, you know, like the, like the the style. Steelers look meme, that's kind of a really nice way of kind of it's 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 a light hearted joke, but yeah. it's not derogatory to anyone. Yeah. It's just kind of, yeah, that's funny. Yeah. I can see it. You know, it's a frog <laughs> dressed up, whatever, it's daft. <laughs> <laughs> but none of the brands in that are like having anything kind of bad said about them. It's just yeah. Yeah, funny so reference. I would see maybe 20 of those a day. I don't think any <laughs> less of Craig Green for that. Yeah. But it does make me think, oh, quilted work jackets, they are, they're banging. Let's yeah. go and see what yeah. he's done this season. Exactly. So it would make me look more at the products closer. I think it's yeah. like any comedy or jokes, isn't it? The, the funniest ones are because it's so close to the truth. Yeah. 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 It just they're so, so you know, relatable. So, yeah, exactly, yeah. and that's, that's what sort of um, draws people in, I think, as well, besides just the comedy value. It's, yeah. You know, you can relate to it. You, you do understand uh, the references and, and the reasonings behind them. Mm. Yeah, it's, so to memes are quite, quite similar to fashion in a way. It's just a cultural reference um, or a house code or something that you've seen loads of times before being re reinterpreted in different ways and in the same way you've got new memes on the same format um, just over and over again. Um, so moving on, um, Craig Green moved to Paris this season um, it's been pitched by the media as a fashion Brexit. Um, Naturally. What, I know that, um, Mike, you work with Liam Hodges. Um, he's also left the London Fashion Week men's schedule. Um, what, why, why do you think so many brands have left this season? I mean, the, the simplest way to look at it is they, they brought Fashion Week forward to the 4th of Jan this year. Um, it was near impossible starting on the 7th for designers to get everything in. With the factories kind of sampling on a really short season, you've got to have everything in by the 20th of December before you get into absolute chaos. Never happens, right? So you're asking us to put on a show on the 4th and it's just, it's physically impossible without someone flying there, bringing stuff back, no one having a Christmas. So I think that puts a stress on the whole design team and after doing it for like six seasons, you're kind of looking at why? why? Why should Men's Week be the one that has to struggle and get yeah. cut? And then we're chatting to buyers, which is obviously, we go to Paris to show for all the showrooms. And all the buyers are saying, yeah, you know, we have to kind of come to Paris, we set up a base, then we come to London, then we come back. And the conversation just began of kind of, why are we just perpetuating this? Why don't we just make a change and move? Yeah. Um, Paris is a big jump. I think a lot, of, a lot of designers are looking at Milan for kind of that first you know, it's like moving away from home. It's like that first yeah. step to like, what do we do? How do we do a, a showroom or a presentation in another country? And as soon as you get that confidence, I think it's like, right, for, for Liam now, I think we'll obviously be looking at Paris in future because everyone's there. Yeah. Why, why not make everyone's life easier? Stylists, yeah. buyers, everyone needs to be in one place. So why spread it out? Yeah. Also cutting down on air miles. Because if you think about how many people are having to go to all these places in such a small time frame, yeah, true. so much money is being thrown on people going around the, country, like, around the world just to see all these shows. So I think it is important for 
people to also <coughs> be aware of that, of course. I think it's something that's always been an issue with London Fashion Week, particularly as well, particularly for buyers. You know, the way the schedule is run, it's like, you know, you pop to London maybe briefly, but then if you want to go and see the other show that's showing at Pitti, and it's easy for you then to go to Milan yeah. and then Paris, yeah. it's almost been like a bypass. And I think that's why sort of British designers always had a base in Paris, whether it be in London showrooms who are now in Milan, I think, for the first time mm. this season, yeah. and a few others that had a base there because all the buyers do congregate there because you can find Italian brands there in the showrooms, uh, British brands, everything's there and it just makes life a lot more easier rather than having to bandy around to yeah. London for a few days and back to Milan and back to Paris and then wherever else next. Yeah, that's true. Well, you remember when London Collection Men first started? Mm. That was honestly like the British boys are going on holiday. Yeah. <laughs> it was like it's all like the British designers like were there. Old. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. Had, it was like a four day party. Yeah. And it was, <laughs> it was amazing because we were all in the same building. We're all learning from each other. We're all talking about kind of the problems. Mm -hmm. we're, we're sharing costs of transport out there. We're shipping collections together. Yeah. Everyone's working towards the same goal. But now it's kind of disappeared. I feel like we've lost that, that kind of like band of brothers yeah, almost. Like Remember brother, like right? when it was like Shannon, Rayburn, yeah. Aggie and Sam, yeah. Liam, yeah. 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 That's what Nick I think, like The whole or, area. Yeah. Or Craig. It's, this is just kind of like a natural departure. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's him being like Right, London kind of hasn't got that anymore or I don't want to be part of London Fashion Week. I think it's him just kind of growing up it's and an taking, evolution. taking the next step, yeah. yeah. And I don't think, I mean, I personally don't, but us as kind of, as, sorry, as um, British like people, we don't kind of think he's leaving London Fashion Week to he's turning his back on it, I think we're kind of yeah. more supportive of it. It's not like a bad breakup. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, we kind of support him on his way. I think it's fitting for, for Craig. I think he always says, you know, London would always be his home and it will always be the brand's home. Yeah. But in terms of aesthetics and his style, you know, when I think of Paris Fashion Week, I think, you know, it's the home of the avant-garde. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he belongs, he belongs with those designers. Yeah. 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 Milan, you yeah. think it's more sartorial to some degree or a bit more classic uh, to some That's areas. Tailoring. But he belongs in Paris. I think it's just like a natural progression yeah. of Craig and even the same for Liam. Like, I feel London at the minute has this kind of group of fashion designers that all get clumped together as yep. kind of the London creatives, like the London club kids, stuff like this, people that have come from Fashion East or CSM, Westminster degrees, mm -hmm. they all kind of get thrown into this one bucket. And so kind of by moving out to different fashion weeks, I feel like it's really gonna help them make a name for themselves and not be thrown in with these other designers and kind of do their own thing. Mm -hmm. I think for London, it's a case of where it was great, where it was just sort of smushed together with Fashion Week as a general. Then we got a weekend, then we had London Collection Men's. For me personally, I feel that London, the menswear, is way more interesting than the women's wear. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I think that, that is sense. something that the, the Fashion Council really need to look at and maybe extend men's a bit more and really focus on that because that's where the real energy and excitement is coming mm -hmm. from, I find rather than the women's schedule where it always opens with Paul Costello. I mean, who on earth buys Paul Costello? <laughs> you know, no, but things like that, it just drags it on and it's just unnecessary. Yeah. It's like, put the focus, you had a focus on it. And if we look at British designs that have been spoken of in the past five years, it's mostly menswear designers. Yeah, yeah. it has yeah. that focus, doesn't no. it? Men's yeah, it has a kind of like USP. You know, I can see that we're sort of the home of sort of really sort of a forward menswear in, in London, more it's so like than anywhere else. Like fresh. Yeah. It's kind of like a fresh of breath there, whereas with the women's wears, people have just kind of done this for Same. a long time. If you look at the mix you know? of designers, you look at Craig and you look at someone like Charles Jeffrey, for instance, or, yeah. you know, completely different yeah. worlds, but still from the same city. Yeah. And I the think most that's diverse what, what makes it vibrant. I think what's a big yeah. shame, though, is that London is still seen as emerging designers, mm. Mm. but never yeah. seen as, like, established. Yeah. And people like Kiko Kostadno, if he gets big, he goes to Paris. Craig Green, he goes to Paris. It's kind of like the progression where you make it to a certain level and then you move to Paris. So now London is just always seen as emerging, emerging yeah. Yeah. creative talent. But we've never actually gotten to Holding. the point where we're, like London is a base. Mm -hmm. So do you think Craig should have stayed? I don't think yeah. he should have stayed because the sphere of fashion right now doesn't allow for him to stay in London yeah. and actually be more successful in terms of going to Paris because all the buyers, like you said, yeah, yeah. Um, they're all in Paris, they're all in Milan. It's more if everyone decided to, as a collective, 
okay, we're going to stay in London altogether, then the buyers will be forced to go to London if everyone decides to go yeah. to London. But do initiatives like you have smaller countries that always do sort of fashion weeks, whether it be Georgia or South Korea many years ago where they invite international buyers there. In particular for someone like Craig, I can imagine how many accounts he has outside of the UK, wholesale accounts, and these guys haven't witnessed one of his shows, where for Craig, that's one of the, the, special, yeah. the spectacles of, of Craig, you know, to, to witness the show, to be there, to absorb everything. And I think by him moving to Paris, he's given those key account holders that opportunity as well, that never have the time to come to London, to be part of the show and actually absorb mm. the every part of the collection. Yeah. 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 Mm. Uh, Craig Green seems to be very relatable for a lot of young men and men of all ages, really, as well as women. Um, I've read quite a bit that it's due to the references that he uses. I've been reading lots of articles um, regarding that he he's kind of a bit of a nerd and like he kind of likes anime and manga and sort of he references martial arts, Boy Scouts, all these kind of like masculine um, traits or masculine endeavors. Um, and a lot of the, his collections sort of go after these references of male vocations uh, or traditionally male vocations, maybe. Um, do you think that sort of relates to why so many men are fans of Craig Green? I think like when you say like masculine references and things like that, but it almost seems like kind of boyhood references, like you said, like anime and, and Boy Scouts and that kind of thing. So it's maybe a little bit of a kind of um, male nostalgia rather than like masculinity, I would say, mm -hmm. because women do wear his clothes. So I think maybe it does maybe type, tap into that psychology of, of guys, especially from, let's say, what, 20, 20 onwards, like, or yeah. even or, you know, around 30, who have that kind of notion of, mm. of nostalgia for what he is referencing, um, rather than like masculine topics. I yeah, I mean, the first thing I noticed from it when, when I was first kind of studying and referencing him was just mm -hmm. the, the desire to kind of keep function in a lot of the clothes. And he talks about functionality in his clothes. Now, to the average person, you'd look at it and you'd say, come on, it's clearly not function for anything. <laughs> yeah. But it's the, the nuance of the function that's coming through with the kind of, I think he did it really well with the Montclair collab. Yeah. Like bringing yeah. these kind of modular folding functional pieces in just kind of really summed up him and his vision like perfectly. And that just reminded me of like going camping, having those inflatable um, yeah. <laughs> brown mats yeah. and all kind of these things is... It's quite boisy. It is, but it's... Something it's easy from to carry my childhood. as well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's from my childhood. It reminds me of like time with my dad, for example. Um, and I think that young men do like to relate to yeah. that. They like to see something of themselves within the collection so they can become attached to it. Yeah. And then they become kind of diehard fans very quickly. <laughs> this was something I don't even think it's like just kind of younger men and younger audiences. Like I know a lot of more middle-aged people, I guess, that actually also love Craig Green mm -hmm. and really relate to the work that he does as well. And that's what I think is really good is, you know, I also relate to Craig in the sense that I was in Girl Guides, all of this. Like he manages to kind of have so many different research points that a lot of people can at least relate to like one kind of topic mm. of his work. I think like how we were discussing earlier as well, you know, how a lot of his references are from his youth and from his childhood and all these little elements that he's picked up. And he incorporates that into, into his design work. And, you know, going back to what, like the modular stuff and functionality and classic menswear tropes, you know, he chose a workwear jacket and work trousers and he's adapted it into his own, his own vision, his own aesthetic. Yeah. And like we were saying with menswear, we, we like things to be functional. If there's a strap, it has to have a function and a reason. It's not just superfluous details. Yeah. And even with the folding away, it reminded me a bit of um, Ita Thrupp when he'd done the pieces with Stone Island, where he'd done sort of segmented panels for the puffer jackets yeah. as well. And I love that idea of where it becomes, it sort of ventures almost into product development to some engineering. Yeah, it's engineering, yeah, it's engineering yeah. exactly. Yeah. And that's what I love about it, where it looks beautiful, but the purpose is there. And yeah. it's so immaculately crafted and engineered that the purpose mm. and the function are exquisite. I was reading, was it um, 
Errolson from Acronym, who was mm. talking about kind of refining very specific details of their products yeah. that they continually release. And I immediately thought of Craig as well, because the quilted work jacket is coming back every season yeah. with tweaks that you might look, oh, he's done it in pink. It's not, there's, there's micro details that are being changed. Which is just refining. And and I think that's what's kind of talking to this nerdier side of a customer mm -hmm. that's, yeah. you said men are obsessed with detail and function. Yeah. That's what we yeah. want to see a lot more. And I think that's what we all kind of look for in clothing and you want to show your mates kind yeah. of yeah. all the daft things your jacket does that theirs doesn't <laughs> basically. But additionally, he's, he's building a core, you know, he's got, he's built his vocabulary and he's building a core wardrobe for his line there. You know, if we look at, I keep mentioning, we look at other designers like Calm, for instance, or Yoji or, or Rick yeah. Owens, for example, who have their core products, you know, so the workwear jacket is a core product for Craig, you'll always be there every season in one uh, variation or another. And then it's developing that wardrobe and developing that collection. It's onwards. nice that he always filters that into his runway shows as yeah. well. He doesn't kind of have this like standalone kind of core collection that you'll see in in store and yeah, just commercial, and yeah. people are buying that. And then he's doing something completely different on the runway. It's kind of all encompassing, and it's nice that even though there are kind of there is a big range to his collection, you still see that that workwear jacket or that so. core little bit. You see pieces clever. from his MA collection kind of still there, still, still there, being yeah. developed. Yeah. Yeah. References are still there. I think it's a very clever way of working because if you kind of look at his runway, you get the looks that are very wearable, will, you know, buyers will lap them up, and it kind of gives him the creative freedom to then dedicate a lot of looks mm. to clearly his full like creativeness of the collection yeah. and so you know he'll he literally pleases everyone because you have more normal people that would buy the workwear jacket or people that would buy more out there pieces you know bigger fashion fans and stuff and then you also get the stuff like the structures like for this past show the one he just did that are just like crazy structures that obviously no one's gonna wear but they're are very creative and really show just how creative that he is. Yeah, to expand on the point you brought up earlier about um, between seasons, he tweaks a little bit and people think, oh, he's just done the same thing. I think he's smart in doing that because what Craig Green does, because his work is based on uniforms, he can actually just change the material and changing the material actually gives the jacket a totally different function. And that could be a uniform for a different occupation entirely. Um, so it's just those little tweaks that people need to look deeper into and actually recognise. It's how you maintain your client as well as this, you know, certain guys or people in general that I'm, I'm one of those guys when I find something that I love, I'll, if I can afford to, I'll buy two or three of the same piece. Yeah, yeah. Or I like to go back to the brand and I want to buy that jacket again. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, but then it's never to be made again. You know, but I think with Craig, by having these elements there, it's fantastic because you're always there, you can always update that sort of staple piece that you have. It's never going to disappear That's from That's it. Too many brands are kind of trying to flip the business every six months. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's got to be a totally new collection. It's yeah. like, why? The stuff's only just gone into a store. Yeah, exactly. The customer that's just bought it, you're now showing him something totally different, saying, this is cool <laughs> yeah. now. They yeah. haven't digested going, yeah. that. Going, oh, yeah. but I've just bought last season's jacket. Yeah. And he changes yeah, yeah. in terms of, like, even just, like you said, material. Yeah. That's what makes his kind of seasonal approach, like the same yeah. jacket in a thin cotton, then it's in the padded. And I think that's, like you said, if you're buying the same style, you kind of want it winter and summer. You yeah. don't want to have these kind of like yeah. two different wardrobes. And I think that's kind of been a big key to his success as well. Leading back to materials, like what I was saying, I think we can see a continuation of his use of plastics in this yeah. collection. Mm -hmm. Where looking at it, it always has this sort of nautical sort of feel to me to some degree with the buoyancy aids and the roping yeah. and the eyelets yeah. and everything. Yeah. And it's really interesting how that sort of ties in where, you know, such a huge conversation at the moment about sustainability and sort of being sort of more eco-friendly in our manufacture and there's nothing worse than plastic. Yeah. You know, for the ocean, I love that he's sort of taken that idea and he's sort of reworking it and reusing yeah, it reusing. In, into the collection sort of ties into the to the concept that he's been pushing through for the past couple of seasons, I think, as well. Yeah, so on that note, shall we go and look at the collection? Um, this collection was the third part of his trilogy on skin. He works in three parts for general collections. Um, so they're usually uh, past, present, and future. Um, so this is the third part of skin, so skin future. Um, do you see that in this collection and what else do you see in there? I kind of interpreted it into the layering 
I'm kind of using it as like a body armor. I almost saw this collection as armoring. That's how I took it. And kind of with what's going on in the world at the minute and everything is very like depressing and all these scary stuff going on. And so I kind of saw the beginning of the collection with the dull tones and <coughs> almost like being like, okay, this is depressing, we need to do something. And then as it kind of carried on, kind of more like a hopeful sign to it, because I think a lot of designers do this whole future concept and just make it like really depressing and kind of like blismal. But you see the kind of dull tones and then you get the sudden bits of print and then it goes on more and more print. So I thought it was really interesting. I thought in terms of as a, as a skin, he's kind of creating these protective layers using kind of re you know, reusable materials that will act as a, as a kind of, yeah, like a protection for maybe future years or like a kind of post-apocalyptic mm -hmm. vibe going on that we kind of need these um, plastics and these cottons to, to protect our skin. Um, as opposed to his last season where it was like exposing the skin, where mm -hmm. this is about yeah, concealing and almost like a like an armor for for kind of what's to come. Yeah, um, just looking at the collection, um, I think the idea of skin does come in some of the first looks, um, in terms of how tight the silhouettes are, and that's kind of like more of a body armor. And then when you go further into the collection, they kind of look like Nordic warriors, mm -hmm. yeah. and. Um, they kind of have, the silhouettes are more structured than the earlier silhouettes, and they look like protected body armor, essentially. And then if you get into the last looks, now it's a bit more mellow. And one thing I do know about Craig Green, just based on his past work, is he normally takes uh, both sides. He uses both sides of the coin, sorry. Uh, so on one side, he'll be talking about the kind of like romance and soft side of protection, and then in another side, he'll be talking about the more brutal side. Um, so that's why you can kind of, looking at both silhouettes, kind of the tighter sort of puffer jackets, and then the more structured silhouettes that look more like tents, kind of similar to what someone said about the Montclair collab. Mm. Um, so yeah, I definitely am a big fan of this collection. Beautiful. I don't think in terms of skin, you can see certain elements carrying on from the last two in terms of the, the textures of the materials used. Uh, the details as well. Um, but what I like is how it's so segmented with the different stories within it, mm -hmm. where you have sort of the more monochromatic quilted elements with the drawstrings, which, as mentioned before, it could be, you know, resemble sort of protection of the body, but then you can cinch it up and then you can expose that part of the body as well, where you feel mm -hmm. more safe and more open. And then leading into, I love these pieces, which have sort of like a chain stitch top stitching over the top. and the sort of lines and the style lines are very similar to the last collection where you have the panels which resemble like the dungarees on the top and the panelling that really just concentrates the eye around the torso area, which you had done in the last collection as well. And just again, the panelling, the way it drops down. And then the beautiful sort of tabards with the floral, almost looks like a sort of water-coloured floral print on it, which he had the similar sort of tunics and tabards in the last season as well and leading into that really sort of light, uh, visually light, because these seems quite heavy visually. Then you get into the more structured, almost tent-like pieces as well. So it's a real sense of lightness and, and freedom there. And comparing it back to the last kind of two collections, it, it does feel kind of like the missing piece that yeah. just yeah. ties it all off. We've got almost three sub-stories within this of the, the kind of the pure light looks kind of representing pure skin on its own, building up to more and more protection until we kind of come to these like, super future protection suits of <laughs> everything that's come together. And what I really like is then we kind of get the campaign hit in a week or so. Yeah. And you'll see kind of these really kind of top tier end designs will then be expanded into a 40 foot windmill or whatever it was last I love his campaign. Kind of, but it all sings the same story which I think is the most yeah. important yeah. thing for it. This just feels like the final part of what he was trying to convey to us, basically. Yeah. Mm. I think for the campaigns, you can see that structure and then you can see the garment that it was taken from or vice versa. Yeah. yeah. You know? I don't think many people managed to scale that and bring it back down to runway level. 
at all, really. Yeah, you know, that's what Craig is really, he's like a very 360 fashion designer. Like you look at these and it's kind of very fine art sculpture. And he also does fashion design and he does all the set design. You know, the, every single aspect yeah. is there. And a lot of, that's what a lot of fashion designers, I think, are missing. They are purely fashion designers. Whereas Craig is, he does everything and he does it so well as well. I mean, the campaigns are great because there's no real product on there. Yeah. You yeah. know, and a ad campaign is to sell product. There should be products everywhere. There is no product. And this is why I love his campaigns. And it reminds me so much of the Comme des Garçons campaigns where mm -hmm. there's never any real product on there. You know, it's just this really sort of striking image. Yeah that sort of pulls you into the themes and, and the stories of the collection itself. Well, that's it. He's making us become a part of his vision. Yeah. Like, he's this is saying, we don't need it on clothes anymore. You've had 30 looks of it. Yeah. This was kind <laughs> yeah. of, this was that kind of crazy goal that we thought, you know, when you're designing as a kid, you think, oh, if I had all the money in the world, I'd do this. And I feel like that's kind of his ultimate, like, showpiece. Yeah, that's what I love, yeah. I think, because he's one of the few designers that's putting on a show again. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Actually putting a bit of theater on the show. to the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. rather so than it just exciting. being it's like. So uh, exciting. Most designers now, this just looks like you're walking into the showroom, or it's like just run by merchandise, like, we've got to have this look on there. And it's like, yeah. sell, 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 where the idea of a show was to showcase literally an idea and a concept and yeah. a theme, and then. But interestingly, because buyers have pushed for more sellable pieces oh, for the yeah. past few years. So they've been saying to every designer, look, we need, we need more SKUs of kind of lower price point. You can items. have that in the showroom. Yeah. You can, but they've pushed them so much that you, you can't, you've got to then, you've got a short window to design and you've got to think about all these sellable pieces as well. So I think the designers have gone, they've ticked the boxes, but then the show is almost a streetwear show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's more due to social media? Because we have to have something that will go viral from the show, yeah. something that the kids will see. And it's like, that was on the show and this is the piece that we're going to produce X amount of and that's going to be our hit of the season. Yeah. Almost used as a marketing tool rather than the show being used as an idea, but to showcase an idea and a concept rather than the product itself. I think Craig Green kind of bypasses having to make sellable pieces because of his core line, mm. yeah, where he can yeah. make the more yeah. wearable stuff and then he can just focus on the more experimental stuff on the runway. Um, so like someone said, the Comme des Garçons business model, uh, kind of similar to what he has, um, I think it makes more sense and if you want to see uh, more artistic design on the runway. I think more brands need to adopt that sort of business model. Mm. Do you think it's interesting then that he doesn't sell on his own web store? Um, I think that's interesting, but just based on work I've done with like previous brands, normally when you have a buyer come in and buy your clothes, they might say, we want it to be exclusive to mm. our store. So actually you can't sell it on your web store. And he has so many accounts now, that could also be a main reason why he doesn't. Do you not find that interesting, though, that stores want exclusivity? For, yeah. me, that's, for me, that says you, you don't want competition. Yeah. Like, don't you, can't, you can't sell against another store. But I yeah, guess him true. not having his own web store, it kind of gives it that little bit of kind of um, desirability in terms of it's not, you can't just order it from, from anywhere yeah. to your house you have to kind of like go to these like specialist stockists and mm -hmm. and it's kind of like creating a little bit of a exclusive world that people will want to buy rather than just kind of clicking I straight think it's good for him it's like it's saying i don't need to take business away from the people that have created my business yeah yeah, yeah true you know it's like i'm here i've got a great sort of wholesale network great stores and yeah. boutiques you do what you do buy well. from there yeah you know i don't need to then try and take out of your pockets because then I might get dropped by a uh, <laughs> store, wherever it may be. But like you mentioned about exclusivity, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm old as hell, so I've been around where we could go to, to showrooms and say, right, I want exclusivity for the first season on this brand, but not to be sold to any store within a five or ten mile radius. Yeah. But then that was before the dawn of like e-commerce blew up everywhere. Yeah. But then that comes also into the buyers. I think where with Craig, you've got so many different facets that you can buy from his collection. Yeah depending on your, your store and your store aesthetic. Mm. You know, and I think his design that you can be a bit more brave with and buy the core product and then buy some really sort of heavy runway pieces. Yeah. Otherwise, every store just has the same buy. And then obviously with Montclair to fill that out as well now. Mm -hmm. But what I love yeah. about the Montclair stuff is one of the only brand collabs I've ever seen where they didn't dilute the brand 
either yeah. or. Yeah. 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 Actually, I was looking at it going, this is weird for Montclair. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost even like beyond Craig's collection, some of the pieces, isn't it? Yeah. It so, feels yeah. like another journey further yeah. on, again, which I think works really yeah. well for exactly. it. I think with Montclair Genius, they did give the designers all creative freedom. It like literally said, it just has to be down material and do whatever you want, take it wherever you want to yeah. take it. So that's why we get such good stuff from the Montclair Genius Collab. Not even just Craig Green, you have people like uh, Simone Rocha, uh, Richard Quinn. I think all their collabs were amazing. I think with Craig as well, because I think he's someone that likes restrictions when he's working, like, like sort of parameters to work with it. Mm. I think with the Montclair Genius, like, right, you know, this is our down, this is the materials we've got, that's what you've got to work with. Yeah. I think most people, it's like the, the least material you've got to work with, that's the more creative you can be to some mm, degree. Yeah. But to have a huge brand like that, just to give you complete freedom, uh, aesthetic freedom, like, you know, this is you. We're just applying you the materials, you do what you do best. I yeah. think it's amazing. And like you said, I think that's why we've seen so many successful collections yeah. mm -hmm. from the, the genius uh, collaborations. Mm -hmm. It's nice that a brand is giving designers a chance to just be them, because often you see them collaborate with, I don't know, more high street brands. And you can just see that they've clearly been told by the people at the company yeah. that they have to be more commercial, you'd water it down, like this isn't gonna sell. And so you kind of just see that brand, but a very diluted version of it. And, and Montclair are good there, because they've got a high price point product already selling yeah. well. It's already luxury, isn't so it? So it's, it's not like a high street collab in the sense of, you know, we're going to just put our logo, your logo, T-shirt done. Yeah. It's more, you know, we're selling jackets for a thousand quid as well. Yeah. So are you. <laughs> like make something just within something. that space. And yeah. like some of the stuff is, yeah. is a little bit cheaper yeah. than Craig's stuff, but it's not massively cheaper. So I think it keeps the integrity of both the brands, and that's yeah. what they've done kind of. Yeah, it's it? still within the realm of high end. High oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like a, a cheap cop out of No, no, yeah. definitely not. Yeah. Yeah. We talked a bit about Com, and um, recently in the last few days, Com have been in the middle of a big scandal regarding the hair. Um, Craig Green has sort of done a lot of things where he's appropriated stuff from different cultures, um, samurais or monks. Um, and last season, I think he did um, Mexican paper cuttings as tops. He didn't seem to be cancelled um, in the way that maybe Com was in the last few days. Why do you think that was? Personally, I think that Craig manages to get a focus point. And so with like the whole Mexican concept he ran, he took it, kind of completely took it into his own world and had that inspiration point, but didn't so closely copy it and kind of, you know, use it to his own benefit. He twisted it, he made it his own. And it, like, actually the starting point was very, completely the opposite end of where he ended. Mm. So I think there's such like a fine line between taking inspiration and completely just copying someone else's culture. Yeah, it's like an inspiration, not a, a reference really, isn't it? It's yeah. like a kind of maybe something he's even had in his, in his head. And, yeah. yeah, I think yeah. people forget designers have to look at interesting reference points to develop a collection every six months, right? There are bound to be things that are from other cultures that we find fascinating. Yeah. I think the, the reason that Com had such a backlash was because of the way they used it. It was, it was too literal. Mm. It needs to be kind of taken, developed, and explored, and appreciated, and then that appreciation shown. Yeah. yeah. Which I feel Craig does more, and I don't think you'd ever look at it and immediately think, oh, he's ripping off another culture. Yeah. And I think Craig's comes from his kind of um, passion for kind of workwear and uniform across lots of different cultures and different reference points. So it seems as though his, he's got a, a vision of kind of exploring that, not just exploring what, you know, different countries kind of wear on the street or what they wore in a particular era. It's, mm. it's kind of taken their um, use of, you know, materials and that kind of practical element across lots of different, different cultures. So it seems like he, he's invest, investigating that within different cultures, not just necessarily a broad spectrum of referencing. Yeah, I think like we mentioned before, I think you know, Craig will take a little element like the cutouts, but then 
put it into his world. Mm. You know, it's like taking a certain sewing technique or cutting technique and you're adapting it into your work. I think that's what he does. But with Calm, um, I think it's more it's a very Japanese thing that they've done because you know, the Japanese designers have always looked to the West, taken almost a very direct <laughs> reference from the West, mm. almost cliche to some degree, but then adapted it and recreated it in their own form. But I feel with this instance, with uh, the Calm show, I think like we were discussing before, I think it's more a case of that they haven't had any black models walking on the catwalk for like nigh on 20 years. And then when they finally do have them on the catwalk, you have sort of white models with sort of braided hair and, and the black models either wearing a braided wig or in their natural hair. Mm. And so I think that's where the key issue for that was in terms of the hairstyle. But then the hairstyle is something that's cropped up again in the past few months. Yeah. Um, yeah with certain influencers or wherever it may be. But I think it's where does it cross the line where it becomes appropriating. It's not really a case of um, cultural appreciation rather than appropriation. I think people pick and choose um, what shows they decide as cultural appropriation because if you look at brands like Haider Ackerman, yeah. he takes a lot of Japanese inspiration in his designs. He has stuff like kimonos and the materials he uses. Um, I don't know if it's because Hyder Ackerman isn't in the limelight as much as big brands like Dior or Comme des Garçons. So that's the reason why people that would lash out aren't seeing it. I think it's mainstream. Um, yeah, but I think what happens is context. So what happens if majority of people that are seeing it aren't really from fashion? Mm -hmm. yeah. They're only going to see one thing. They're not going to think there's nuance in it. Uh, where's the inspiration coming from? They're just going to see it for face value. I think considering that, because brands want to expand as a brand, you want to sell more, you want yeah. to grow. Um, they have to consider that, like you said, they don't make things too direct mm -hmm. in terms of when they reference these things. It has to be a bit more subtle. I think that's where Craig Green is really good because he knows how to make it subtle to the point where people just looking at it for the first Craig time won't, won't just assume a certain thing from like their first look. Mm -hmm. So yeah. It's a conversation I was having with a friend of mine. We're like, look at Dries. Like, Dries, for his whole career, has literally <laughs> referenced and been influenced by sort of ethnic minorities or whatever else. I mean, all his embroideries are still done in India and everything else. And again, this, you know, we think of Dries Van as a huge designer, but not a huge commercial designer, as it were. Mm -hmm. And it's like the finger has never once been pointed at him for his use of print, colour, this, that, the other. But I think because he yeah. does it, he's encapsulated it to be part of his own world and he does it in such a tasteful way that it's not maybe considered uh, cultural appropriation but if maybe if another designer done it then the finger would be pointed immediately. Yeah. I think also as well like what we're kind of big what we're discussing is the casting and the hair and, mm -hmm. and that element where with Craig it's almost like I mean he uses beautiful boys beautiful models but it's like the clothes come first and it's it's about it's about that and it's I think that's a big element into what, what people pick up on is, is the casting as well. And I think you don't, you just kind of know Craig for his it's clothing. You don't that think is, about his kind of like his, his model he uses or his like the hairstyles or yeah. anything like that. It's, it's the clothes first. I think that comes into Craig's whole kind of thing about community and uniform. Like mm -hmm. anyone can wear it, anyone from any background, no matter what you look like, you can wear it. And that's just summed up with the casting as well. Yeah, before we close, um, the shoes are probably what's going to be talked about quite a bit on social media anyway. Um, they have a new collab with Adidas, and the second in the collaboration. Um, what do you think of them? <laughs> um, I think, first of all, Adidas is trying to uh, push the superstars a bit too hard, <laughs> considering Prada just came out with that terrible collab. And now, uh, obviously, Craig Green's version is way more tasteful. And I actually like it, even though I hate superstars. But I um, see the superstars that scroll on to the next one. In terms of that, it almost seems like, because I think someone said the um, 75th anniversary of superstars is soon. So I think they're trying to really push it. Um, but going to the other uh, sneakers, well, there was uh, AstroTurf. Mm. And this, again, I don't know how fashion just works in a way where Balenciaga released their Zen sneaker mm. that looks like an <laughs> AstroTurf football shoe. And then 
Craig Green has come out. So all those shoes, I'm not really a fan of them. What I am a fan of is the one that looks like a tent. Mm, the blue and it has a like boost material at the bottom. I think that's a really Craig Green. But well, that's exactly it. They look like yeah. Craig's yeah. done his own shoe. Yeah. It looks like the Grenson ones is done with the sort of centre yeah. seam to some degree, doesn't it? They do it? not look like a collab at all. No. no. Yeah. That looks like if you gave him a shoe factory to work with, this is what he'd kind of... Yeah. And then the, 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 the football Astro is quite funny because we had um, Wales Bonner, who had the yeah. Mondials as well, <laughs> yeah. as well as sort of Craig doing them here as, as well. Mm. With a, But I, I don't mind these. They're quite cool because I like the top stitching that he's done, which is... You know, very similar to the garments that he's done, which were quite heavily top stitched. Yeah. Mm. I feel it's again he's kind of sorry, done this whole thing where you get like there's a more normal version of the shoe, and then there's kind of more out there shoes, which is also reflected in his clothing. So you know, you can see normal people wearing some of those shoes, whereas in my opinion, the nicest ones are the tent ones. But I feel like they're kind of a lesser option for your standard person as it was. I think the thing as well is that I don't really go to Craig for a hype collab. You know, if, if I want a hype collab, I go to lots of other brands. Mm -hmm. I, I love the fabrication, the pattern cut in, the shapes and structures he puts in. So that's kind of what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. This shoe just kind of, it, it's nice, like you say. Would, yeah. I, would I rush out to buy it? No. Would I, <laughs> would I maybe pick them up in sale? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the tent shoes, I'd be kind of thinking, right, I want to get my hands yeah, on the tent shoes, yeah. I love those. Yeah. Those are so Craig Green. Yeah. Even yeah. just like the little bungee cord on it and everything, it's just like everything about them. Again, just the, the sort of layering over the top with that blue material, it yeah. sort of harks back to the, the clothing where it's sort of, sort of layered two fabrics. Yeah. You know, they're sort of more transparent, sort of PVC over some of the quilted fabric. The whole Very skin cool. thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, the Astro Tales just for a little flex on five side or something. <laughs> <laughs> These kind of remind me of those like blue things you put over when you don't want to get the set dirty on a photo shoot. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Is that like yeah, third skin kind of yeah. protection element? It kind of goes back to that protection thing again. The, yeah. Like the skin protecting. And like preserving skin, maybe, yeah. like preserving your like your trainers. Yeah. Yeah, they're cool. So before we leave, um, last thoughts and what do you think of the collection? I wanted to ask everyone what they think about uh, the bags. Because mm. Craig normally doesn't have bags, but in this collection you can kind of see um, some bags. So what does everyone think about this? There are some really nice bags, like the first look. Um, there's like a tiny, I don't know if it's a card holder or something like that, but I really personally enjoy them. <laughs> and I've been waiting for ages for Craig to come out with the bag. bags, <laughs> a bag that I can wear. I like those in the sort of black and grey looks because they almost look like the material is almost like a tarpaulin which mm. has been sort of coated yeah. in a sort of black coating. And I don't know how that will age, but I think it would be really nice if it starts to crack away. And, but then even the bags, you can see all the details with the, with the drawstrings, the pulleys, it all super ties into the clothing itself. You know, so I'd love to see them up close and see if they actually do have a function as well, which I'm assuming they should do. This is it. They look like they're attached to the jacket. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And also these modular pieces yeah. that you just add on top of each other. Yeah. It's interesting that he, he's in previous collections done like totems that the models carry, but they don't have a function. And they're not a too far a cry from that kind of thing, but they do now have some sort of function um, for the wearer. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I think it's a good move on his behalf because accessories and bags are always big sellers across yeah. all brands ever. So in terms of him making money on this, good idea. Yeah. It's good to expand the product range a little bit, but not too fast where you have everything within sort mm. of five mm. years. You know, I think he's established himself in terms of his clothing, some of the collaborations are done with like Bjorn Borg previously and with Montclair, now with Adidas. And I think it's nice just to start adding in gradually rather than throwing everything at the wall. Yeah. 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 Mm. There's even a cross body bag that um, I just saw um, on that blue look. It's quite interesting. And it's nice, I guess, well, as far as I know, he hasn't kind of collaborated on a, a kind of bag line. Mm -hmm. it's, it's probably just from his namesake, which is, which is quite nice because sometimes that can feel a little bit forced if that mm. happens so it's kind of a nice kind of continuation of his his brand that he's controlling yeah 
I'm also wondering, are the hats kind of different kind of bags? Because the hats um, seem to have like handles. Probably. <laughs> I, I love those hats. Great. Yeah. Those hats are I love them to be like multifunctional. We can just probably use them like a basket <laughs> yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah. Take those guys into the shops to take my hat off. Yeah, for something. Your bag. <laughs> yeah. Probably. It is. I wonder how many of the hats are actually the same style, but because of all the mm. straps and mm. things, they're actually just styled yeah. completely differently. It would be nice to see yeah. when they come out. Even on these blue looks, I love the, the little black ties. It just reminds me of the top of bin line. Is it only to tie up? Has that ties and yeah. 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 bringing back? It reminds me a lot of the work when. So sort of Judy Blame come into it again because of Dior, but mm. that's something he would use a lot in his work, and yeah. even like Gareth, who Judy inspired quite a lot. And I just love those little, the idea of the plastic which he brings in, and something which looks so everyday. Exactly, and, and that's the thing you want to get up and close and personal with this collection, don't yeah. you? You kind of like you can see pictures, but you're like, oh, I want to see the, like, yeah. the, the textures and feel the materials, materials as well. And that's yeah. why, yeah, people will kind of venture out to the shops and kind of not kind of see it on a website and buy it from there. I think. Yeah, that's kind of like the beauty of Craig, really. That's the thing with fashion, though, isn't it? Like we always we, we consume most of it through through digital imagery now. Yeah. yeah. You know, I say like fashion is, is a tactile thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a three D object. You have to touch it. You have yeah. to see how it hangs. An image can only tell you so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then once it looks great in the photo, once you're there, like oh, I don't really like the texture, the material. It's mm -hmm. it's quite funny, and I think you know you should experience it. It's like Physically. selling fragrance online. Yeah. Always makes sure. <laughs> <laughs> You've got scratch and sniff screens you know coming I mean? many times. So. You're right, though, but the, when you go and kind of, I remember it was a couple of years ago going into DSM and seeing kind of the first Craig Parkers in there. Mm. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah, I've seen it. It was nice. And then you pick it up, the weight of it, the feel of it yeah. is just a whole other level to it that, yeah. mm. you know, a passing comment online, you might just be like, oh, yeah, 1,500 quid. No, not for yeah. me. <laughs> but then when you touch it, when you feel it, you appreciate mm -hmm. it so much more. And also the price tag just goes hand in hand with like the artist behind it. Like there's so much thought, design behind it. It really does go hand in hand with the price tag. Mm -hmm. Like his stuff is something that you, personally I would save up for. Like it's something that I would put money aside to try and get a piece. What I love about his collection, like most of his collections, his, it's always very clean. You know, it's very sharp, very clean, but very graphic as well. You know, so it trans, you know, it translates amazing in imagery, particularly different paneled areas, you know, very harsh, very graphic lines. Mm. But then he's also got this real beautiful softness and lightness to his pieces also as well. And I really enjoy that contrast with, with Craig. I think going back to what you were saying about sort of the dark and light. Yeah. You know, I, I love the contrast that he always has, that sort of tug of war between the two. Mm. But somehow they work in harmony. And yeah. it's I think the mass appeal of uh, Craig Green I've always noticed is uh, he said himself that he doesn't really want to delve into women's wear because he feels like his hands are too big. <laughs> He's more of a craftsman. Um, when I look at his collections, his menswear collections, there's nothing that actually strikes me as feminine. Mm. And I know something uh, that men struggle with is kind of coming out their comfort zone. And the reason why so many people buy Craig Green is it's this balance between being avant-garde, being experimental, but still looking masculine. Mm. Yeah. I think. He bridges that gap perfectly. Yeah. yeah. That was one thing when I was reading up on Craig Green, I found some old style zeitgeist um, forums. And in his early collections, I don't know who was styling it, but there were lots of sort of exposed midriffs and stuff that were yeah. on that forum considered like feminine and sort of gay. Um, and it's interesting how he's developed from there to be this sort of more neutral, masculine kind of thing. And I wonder, what that contributes to his success. I think maybe it's just everybody catching up with him, essentially. Mm. I don't think he's kind of gone against those comments and created something different and I'm not going to do midriffs anymore because of that content. <laughs> I think he's actually just been instrumental in changing the kind of like stratosphere of menswear and that commercially is, has gone, has driven down to that message and men have, have caught up with what he's saying and his language, really. As opposed it's to definitely, it's definitely influenced uh, a new era of designers, definitely. but maybe not as obvious as yeah. as others would have. You, know yeah. I mean? you can see little Craigisms in people's work, or maybe the way of working, or the lines, or something like that. But it's not as a copy and paste mm. yeah. type of Craigisms. Greenisms. New term created here today. <laughs> <laughs> the show notes discuss a bit about um, how the body is put into earth and then there's a new growth 
represented by the flowers, I guess, from this and the sort of the tents or might be sort of growing tents, a greenhousey type thing. Do you think this is new birth for Grey Green going to Paris? I think so, but at the same time, I did read somewhere that he actually finished this collection kind of before he knew that he was actually showing in mm -hmm. Paris. Yeah. Okay. So I kind of, again, with the whole like dystopian world, I don't know whether it's something to do with new life, like hope, that kind of thing. Like, I mean, this might be like a shot in the dark, but you know, poppy fields in the wartime, mm -hmm. that's what the first thing that came to my mind was kind of making the beauty out of something that isn't really there. I think because he's been showing, what, six years now? Seven years, give or take. I think it comes yeah. to that point where, again, sort of, sort of bookend in one part of it, and then, you know, he's, he's found, his, he's created his alphabet, his own uh, visual vocabulary. You know, over the past few years, like these are all the elements which constitute myself and my work. And I think the audience have got that now. You know, we can look at a piece and know straight away, that's a Craig Green piece. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, and I think from there now, he's established that. And now I think going forwards, he might start to open up a bit more, might to experiment a bit more, not as um, drastically. I think the same continuation how he's been working within collections of three, developing ideas mm. and moving them forward. I think we're going to see and much more of that coming through in the future, with still with his key details and signatures in there, but maybe less prominent. Yeah. Because people are aware of his silhouettes and stuff. Now we don't need the drawstrings or ties to clearly state or show that it's a Craig Green item. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it almost felt like a bit of a, a best of Craig Green, this mm -hmm. collection, didn't it? Like all of his like amazing elements like were all in that collection. Like it was almost like such an overload of his like all his kind of key amazing things that he does then, like you said, the next one might be a kind of little bit of a kind of declutter of ideas maybe and kind of like progressing into a new new staples and and the kind of new techniques maybe. I think we can all say that this collection sort of says Craig Green has arrived mm -hmm. in Paris and sort of mm -hmm. at a stage in his career where he is an established designer. Um, so yeah, I think that's a great place to tie this off. Um, so thank you to all the panelists and thank you all for watching. For more extensive Fashion Week coverage, be sure to check out showstudio.com. And if you're watching via Show Studios YouTube, be sure to like, comment and subscribe below and we will see you next time. Thank you.